Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Xanthus Gaming. We're here today in Wilson and we're going to be going over my occult slash store lord build, which I really enjoy. We're going to start off with a build demo and intro. Then we're going to go into skill layout, passive tree, in-depth gearing guide, and an exposition of an expedition. I hope you guys enjoy. Make sure to like, favorite, share, subscribe, all that good stuff if you do. Without further ado, let's go ahead and have a look at the demo. Alright, so that was a gameplay demo of a boss battle, and then this one is a gameplay demo of some just trash clearing. I just wanted to kind of show you it's efficient at both, and pretty tanky for either one. As you can see, those uh, those big guys hit really hard and apply very fast ticking bleed effects, and you can just pretty much tank it. Most of the bosses you can tank if you position well, um, if you're going with the damage option, we'll talk about the different options later. And then if you go with the toughness option, you can ignore most of the mechanics in the game, which is pretty cool too. So let's go ahead and take a second and get on into the actual uh, build and talk about all the different things with that. I turned on the in-game sound because I think it was overlapping there for a second. But let me go ahead and turn that back up for you guys. All right, so we looked at the demos. The next thing we're going to look at is the skill layout. I built out some nice little graphics to make it easier for you guys to kind of see. Um, when we're looking at how the skills are laid out, I do row 1, row 2, row 3, row 4, and I refer to it as like 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 2A, 2B, so on and so forth. So hopefully that makes sense for you guys. Alright, so when we're looking at the runes we're using, we're going to be using Havoc Orb, Bulwark, Winter's Grasp, Anomaly, and Annihilation. Havoc Orb is going to have runes 1A, 1B, 2C, 2D, 3A, 3C, 4D. I will have this uh, image in the video description down below if you want to go back to it. I'm just going to leave it up on the screen for a few seconds if you want to pause. Okay. And the different things that are going to happen from these runes are the Havoc Orb is going to have Area of Effect increase, Ailment Chance increase, Crit Chance increase, an extra projectile, Crit Damage, Minimum Range Reduction, and an extra projectile. Um, Bulwark, which is your beam of light that heals and also damages. We're adding duration, HP, regen tick increase, extra AoE damage. Uh, normally it just heals. With this rune, it lets you damage. Attacks do sacred damage while inside the area. This applies to your Havoc Orb because your Havoc Orb is an attack instead of a spell. So this lets your Havoc Orb proc, proc sacred damage, and we'll talk about why that's important later. Spell casts on cursor so you can target where it's going. Cooldown reduction and all resist. Your Winner's Grasp, which is like a Frost Nova, we're going to change it from Frost into Shadow because it works with our Occult Stacks that we're going to be using for this build. We're going to be using Crit Chance with it, Spell Cast on Cursor instead of around your body. We're going to do Crit Damage and a Lingering AoE effect on the ground. For Anomaly, we're going to take Instant Damage on Pole. This one looks like a black hole. Uh, we're going to take increased duration. We're going to have the vor Vortex Pole multiple times. We're going to do extra Crit Chance allow you to cast a second version of Anomaly within the same cooldown and take some crit damage. Annihilation is your Beam of Doom that will increase damage the longer you channel it. The beam will pierce through enemies, it has a bigger radius, higher crit damage, and will buff Toxic and Aether damage of you and all your allies in the game. Let's take a second look at each of those abilities. So if we're looking at, uh, let's look at Beam of Doom, that's Annihilation, then Anomaly, is a black hole. You can see I can cast it again within the same cooldown. Bulwark of the Dawn is a heal that also damages. And then Winter's Grasp we changed into Shadow Based and it leaves a persistent AoE on the ground. And then Havoc Orb is kind of our burst and rage dump to allow us to get back willpower. So basically how it works is we engage, we drop down an Anomaly, we drop down a Winter's Grasp, we drop down Bulwark, Fire a quick Havoc Orb and then channel Annihilation Beam, so it looks a little something like this. I did that a little bit slow so you could see it, but you can get quicker at it the more you practice it. 
And then as you need to, you can recast. Remember, you can cast two versions of Anomaly. Bulwark. And then we burn. And we burn. And we run out of willpower. We just do it a couple more times so we get it back. And then we just rinse and repeat, right? And that's pretty much how it works. Alright, let's go on back into our handy dandy graphical images. And we're going to look at the talent tree next. So on the talent tree, we're going to start off by taking the attrition strategist, which is going to give us increased ailment chance. After that, we're going to move up to immortal offering, which is going to give us a stacking damage buff for each ailment that's on the target. We're guaranteed to be doing sacred shadow and aether, uh, which is going to be weakness, stasis, and I can never remember the last one. Weakness, stasis, and curse on enemies. So we automatically have 75% increased damage from cab Cableist. Cableist? Cableist? Not sure how that's pronounced. Um, but if you have any additional ailments, like you happen to have fire on your weapon, and it applies with your Havoc Orb spell, then that's another 25% damage. So you could potentially get more elements on there. Do note that each spell can only do two different debuff types, and it's going to be whichever is the highest damage in your stats for that debuff type. Uh, so if we're looking and you're trying to figure out what it is, you can right click on your ability and it's going to tell you that you have a chance to apply stasis and cursed. I have a chance with this one. I have a chance to apply shock and cursed. Uh, that's messed up. Actually, I need to change that because I want it to be, um, I want it to be sacred and cursed. So I was playing around with my gear earlier and that's why. Um, normally, I would be wearing different items, so I would have this ring on instead of that, and I would have my lucky belt on as well. So that's probably why that's happening. I would also have this on. So there we go. So I would normally have uh, weakness and curse. There we go. On my winner's grasp, if I'm looking at my bulwark, I'm going to be doing weakness and curse. And then if I'm looking at my uh, black hole, I'm going to be doing stasis and curse. And you can manipulate this by changing your gem and your weapon um, to make it so it applies sacred damage on spells. That way you can proc your passive that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Back to a passive tree. After getting that big damage buff based on ailments that you have, you're going to grab which time cannot heal, which makes it so whenever an enemy is afflicted by stasis, they take the same damage that you just hit them with again after 1.5 seconds. So if I hit them for a thousand in 1.5 seconds, they'll get another tick of a thousand on them. This works out really well because we're throwing lots of AOEs on the ground that tick very fast and we'll always have stasis on them enemies. So basically we just double our damage with this talent, which is great. Dire Juncture allows you to spread the damage you're taking out over time. It's kind of like a stagger mechanic. The trade-off is your maximum health and force shield is 15% smaller. We will grab the upgrade to this that makes it not quite as bad, so the penalty is not as high. Then we're going to grab Grievous Afflictions and Cabalus, which gives us an additional chance to apply ailment stacks. And we're actually going to grab this node here too, which allows you to double your ailment applications. I don't know why I didn't have it in this screenshot or on this video, but that is part of the tree. And uh, I will have in the video description a link to the full talent tree. So if you want to go through and look at that, you absolutely can. And that will be in the in the video description, the link. All right, so after we've moved through all of this, we're going to scooch over to the side. And then we're going to be moving into the exorcist and assassin trees. In the assassin tree, we're going to grab critical hit damage. We're going to do that after we grab branded burst, which gives us a ton of durability, a lot of survivability. Basically gives you damage mitigation when you're not getting hit. You have stacks of it every time you get hit. It reduces a stack, but since we're doing so much crowd control, basically it just serves the purpose of soaking up really hard hitting spells for us. It works out pretty well. After we finish up there, we're going to move along down south in the tree, and we're going to be picking up Feast for Crows for some Life Leech, which is going to be Sustain and Toughness in the Warmonger tree. In Abyssal Shaper tree, we're going to be picking up Occult Affliction, which gives us stacking percent damage based on how many stacks of Curse the enemy has. So it's really important we're applying Curse with our Frost Nova ability, uh, which turns into Shadow Nova, right? Um, and it's five for every stack of curse and since we're grabbing nodes that increase the number of stacks we can have that means we're scaling up that damage even higher 
in the Eos tree. We're grabbing Dawn's Pious Striker. You probably actually want to go to that first and then go over to Occult Affliction just because this is such a strong talent. Whenever enemies are under 15% health, they get executed. Uh, it says underlings and specialists only, but then we take the upgrade note that basically lets it be anything. So we just basically, after doing 85% of a mob's health, they just get executed by a yellow bolt of lightning from the sky. You guys probably saw it in the video there. Um, it's really kind of cool. Uh, let's just go back and have a look at that in the video real quick so you can see it. If you watch when I cast the spell on these guys, there's going to be an area of effect on them. And as they start getting low on health, you'll start seeing them get zap, 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 zap. That's from the sacred damage from that ability, which is Dawn's Pious Striker. Every time they get down to 15% health, they get zapped. And it's it's just fantastic. It's just fantastic. I love it. All right. And then after that, we're going to move on over into the Warlock Tree using our travel notes. And we're going to be grabbing Raining in the Darkness. And it gives you 100% additional spell crit chance while willpower is above 75%. That does not mean you have 100% spell crit chance. It's saying it's doubling your current spell crit chance of your skills. So it's a great talent to get. We'll be getting this in kind of the mid to late game. We'll be in our mid 40s when we get this. So I think that's about the right time to pick this up. After that, we'll be moving further right on the tree. And we're going to be grabbing uh, Salvatory Anchor in the Siege Breaker tree, and then we're going to be grabbing Elevated Gain in the Siege Breaker tree. These give you just a ton of extra toughness. I would recommend either wearing the Heavy Armor to get the All Resistance doubling, or the Bruiser Armor in order to get even more health regen than you already have. I don't know why the game music just decides to cut out, but I guess it's gone. Oh well. After we grab those, we're going to beeline our way up to Kingless Aegis, which is going to give us additional block chance and allow any of our weapons to block. This is great. As we're grabbing stuff down here, we're also going to get additional block efficiency and block chance, so that'll help scale that. And then we're just going to take and fill in any other nodes that we didn't grab that I didn't go over with you. Just refer back to the overall chart and grab whatever you need. So yeah, hopefully that makes it pretty clear what we're doing on the talent trees. Let's go ahead and move on to stat priorities. When we're looking at our stat priorities, we're seeing that we're going to be having three different gearing options depending on how you want to play it. I like the first option, which is everything into Ferocity. If you put everything into Ferocity, you're going to be critting a ton more. You're going to be way more efficient. It is the squishiest option, though, so you have to really watch your positioning. Uh, that said, even with having to watch your positioning a bit, you can tank a lot of damage with this build. It's just you can't face tank bosses all the time. You can actually face tank quite a bit from bosses, but not everything. So if you go all ferocity, you do have to be a little careful sometimes, and you'll get a feel for it as you play through it. Second option, if you're not for the daredevil approach, if you're a little bit more squeamish, is you could do a 2 to 1 ratio of ferocity to toughness, which means for every 2 points of ferocity, you're going to put in 1 point of toughness. It does a little bit less crits because you have less crit chance, but you're a bit less squishy and it allows you to have a little bit sloppier position and be a bit more tanky and then of course the third option is you could go all toughness or you could reverse these ratios and do two toughness for one ferocity but if you go all toughness you're going to have significantly less crits you do still clear it's just quite a bit slower um but you're extremely tanky it's extremely forgiving you can ignore most mechanics in the game and just face tank them uh it's pretty cool honestly if you're like just spacing out and watching a tv show maybe this is the way you're going um, but if you really want efficiency, I'd go all ferocity. That's what I'd recommend. That is if they don't change how these attributes distribute and play out in the future. All right, so now let's look at our gear overview and what we're going to be looking at for that. This is going to be a general overview, and then we're going to go into in each individual piece. So on the general overview, the most important thing you're looking for is cooldown reduction followed by crit damage. After crit damage, you're looking at plus damage added to spells. Specifically, you want to be looking for Aether Damage or Sacred Damage, but if you find other things, they're good too. You also want to be finding Occult Percent Damage is your next highest priority. After that, you're looking for All Resist, and then Health Regen, Health, and Toughness. Following that, you're looking for Transfer Time Reduction, and then Resource Cost Reduction, reduction and last, Increase Casting Speed. Now we're going to go into each individual piece of gear or sets of gear and talk about what the different priorities are on those. On the helm, chest, and legs, you're looking for build flow first, damage second, and then defensive stats third. 
On the build flow side, you're looking for cooldown reduction, absolutely the most important stat for this build because you're using a lot of longer cooldowns. Then you're looking for some spell casting speed. This one is kind of optional. You don't have to have that. You can just drop that from your priority list if you want to. Um, I like to look for it when I can find it. If I have to choose between something on uh, spell reduction or casting speed or something damage based, I'm usually going to choose damage based. But keep in mind, casting speed increases how quickly you cast your AoEs, increases how quickly your beam of death ticks for. So it is a really strong stat. I'm not 100% sure if it should be in the first priorities, but I put it there for now. In the second priority set for these pieces, you're looking for crit damage, occult damage, percent damage, or crit chance. And then third, you're looking for some defensive stats, all resist, health, toughness, and regen. Typically, these particular pieces tend to skew more towards the defensive stats, but if you can find these, they're really strong, and that's what you should really be looking for there. Right, now after we're done with our main body pieces of armor, we're looking at our boots, which are just a little bit different because they have the ability to get movement speed on them. I also prioritize crit damage, occult damage, just the damage stuff I prioritize higher. You can see on the first one, on the last one we were prioritizing the, uh, the build flow a little bit higher on the boots and prioritizing the damage higher. Same overall things that you're prioritizing other than that you're looking for movement speed on your boots. After that, we're looking at our arms, which is our shoulders and hands. And on our shoulders and hands, we're looking for damage first, build flow second, and defense third. Same abilities that were, or same stats we're looking for damage wise on the arms, crit damage, occult damage, uh, damage percent, and crit chance. And then build flow. This one's just a little bit different. We're looking for resource cost reduction, because that can pop up on these items. And then resource regeneration just makes it a little bit smoother, a little bit easier to play. For defensive stats, we're looking at the same things. I'll resist first, health, and toughness second, and then health regen, finally, and last. If you can find any sort of spell leech, uh, that's really good too, uh, because a lot of your toughness comes from leeching back off of spells. But we do get a lot of that off the talent tree, so I didn't prioritize it on gear, but if you find it, it's great. Following that, we're looking at our accessories. Accessories are neck, both rings, and belt. They all have the same possible stats that can roll. So on the accessories, you're looking for plus Aether or Sacred Damage to spells, not to attacks. Plus Aether or Sacred Damage to spells. The reason those ones we're looking for specifically is we are scaling up the damage of those through our talent tree, and it does apply to the plus damage that we're getting on our items. After that, we're looking for crit damage, occult damage, percent damage, crit chance, and any other plus damage types just has extra raw damage onto your, uh, your build. Right? And again, when we're looking at other plus damage times, like plus lightning damage to spells, you want to look at the two, the two spells part. If you're doing it to attacks, all it's going to be adding on to is for Havoc Orb, and uh, everything else is going to not matter for that. So if you're looking for plus damage, again, you're looking for plus damage to spells. Because if it says two attacks, then you're just getting the plus damage modifier on your Havoc Orb but not your Aether Anomaly, not your Shadow Nova, not your Bulwark of the Dawn, not your Annihilation. It doesn't affect any of those abilities. So all you're getting if you're doing attacks is this Havoc Orb damage. But if you're doing spells, you're getting everything else. Okay. Uh, after that, we're looking for build flow. Again, resource cost reduction, resource regeneration. If you happen to find cooldown, um, that's top priority no matter what, right? I don't think cooldown rolls on these items. I think it only rolls on head, chest, and legs, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Defensive stats, same priorities as before. Um, we're not really prioritizing force field unless you happen to get a piece of gear that just has an absurd amount of force field on it, like my boots. My boots just have an, or my pants just have an, oh no, my boots just have an absurd amount of force field. So I didn't pass it up. I was like 1,480 force field. It's got force field added onto the item and then increased force field percent. It's just too much effective health to pass up. But typically, you're not really looking for force field right now, mostly because the force field stuff is broken in the game. And they're working on fixing it, but as far as how it works right now, the talents for force fields don't work. So I skipped over them and went for health things instead. All right, on to our weapons. On the weapon you're looking for, oh, this one's actually really, really important. You're looking for, of course, first total damage. 
um, because that's going to scale up your damage, period. But total damage mostly applies to your Havoc Orb, because your spells don't grab damage from the weapon. But you are looking for plus Aether or Sacred Damage again two spells because that will scale all your abilities. Then you're looking for crit damage, occult damage, damage percent, crit chance, and any other damage types. Uh, if you can find a weapon that has sacred on it, even if it's sacred on attack, it's not bad because it allows your Havoc Orb to proc your execute talent a little bit easier. So that could be something you could have your eye out for. On um, build flow, we're looking for, again, resource cost reduction and regeneration, and defensive stats are the same as they've been throughout. All right, on to gem priorities. This is probably the most important part of the gearing and will make or break the ability to play this build, so listen up. On weapons, you're wanting to get offense two slots, and you want to maximize how many slots on each one. On the image on the screen, every one of those pieces of gear has a maximum number of slots. I burned all my gold to get it there. And everything but the chest is optimized. So, we're going to talk about that. On the weapon, you're looking to put in a single silver stone because this will allow sacred damage um, to be added onto your spells. And that's going to make it so that your spells can always proc your execute, no matter what. Even if your spell doesn't normally do sacred damage, now it does, and it will proc your execute. It doesn't have to be so much that it applies to the ailment stack, it just has to have the damage, period. So make sure you put a silver, a silver stone into your weapon on an offensive two slots. After that, we're going to do Alexandrite and the other two offensive two slots, because that will give us extra spell crit damage, and spell crit damage is a main way that we're scaling up this build's damage. On the accessory side of things, we're looking to grab support three slots and then throw amethysts into them to get transfer t reduction time between willpower and rage. That just basically means that it will transfer between willpower and rage a little bit easier which makes things a little bit smoother so you can see it's quickly transferring so we can fire off our havoc orbs quicker and then it pops back into willpower so we can fire off our abilities quicker. The more of that you have the smoother the gameplay goes so you want to make sure that you are grabbing that on those support slots in the jewelry access accessory slots. Do note that if you have uniques, you cannot gem them. I have heard that there's a way to convert it using the garrison system from a unique into a legendary, keep the same stats, and allow you to gem it. I haven't confirmed that yet, but make sure you have gems on it if they're not purple items. So again, we're looking for support three on the accessory slots and an amethyst to do the transfer reduction time between willpower and rage. All the other armor types are going to be defense three slots that you're looking for. They're the diamond green, diamond green slots. And in those, you're going to want to throw Alexanderite in every single one of them because it will give you a percent increase of your all resist, which is amazing. If you run out of gold or you don't feel like rerolling a slot and you have a defense slot that's a one or a two and not a defense three, then you can throw an amethyst in for HP or gem or global life leech respectively. Both very strong stats as well. All resist is just better because it's mitigation instead of regen. And if you have to choose between mitigation and regen, you want to do mitigation because it's always better to prevent damage than to try to heal it back because you might not always be able to heal it back within the right time period. So always err on the side of mitigation over recovery. All right, and that is pretty much our build guide. We're going to end out with a demo of a playthrough of a expedition i'll play that boss kill again and then we're going to join about halfway through an expedition i started realizing hey this is a really good one to showcase so i recorded it hopefully you guys enjoy it if you do make sure you like favorite share subscribe i know this was a little bit long-winded but hopefully it was very informative make sure to let me know what you think in the comments down below and either way thank you guys for being here today i hope you have a wonderful wonderful day bye youtube
it's not happening. Can't manage that one. Oh, do note that on this playthrough we are playing significantly above our level. If you look in the top left corner, you can see our level that we're playing through here. And then if you look in the bottom right, you can see, or not the bottom right, over right directly below the minimap, you can see the monster level. It looks like we're about 21 levels below the monster level, so we're playing at 64 and the monster level is 85, I believe. It's kind of hard to see on my OBS. Uh, but we're playing significantly above our level and this build is still just shredding and plenty tough. Gotta catch my breath. It's not happening. 